G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. It is time for another trade update. I started working on a bit of a trade update today, opened the Word doc and started going through it and I was like, oh, do we have enough for a trade update today? Well, when I got stuck into it, I realized quite a lot has happened since the last time I did one of these trade updates, which was about two days ago. We're probably at the point where it's gonna be daily. So on that note, does anyone enjoying the content um, and particularly wants to see updates around the trade and draft space, although we do all kinds of content here, I'd really appreciate it if you consider subscribing. 57% of the people over the last month, which has been a huge month for the channel actually, 57% of those people have not subscribed and that's the highest I've seen that number in about a year now. So it would mean a lot to me if you considered doing so, but let's get into some trade stories. So we finally have an answer on James Peatling and I did not see this one coming. James Peatling, after being pursued by Adelaide, St Kilda, West Coast, Collingwood, Melbourne and the Western Bulldogs and, and probably some other teams as well that have gone unnamed. And despite the fact that he verbally committed to staying to the Giants a few weeks ago, he has requested a trade to the Adelaide Crows. And I, like I said, this one took me a little bit by surprise. Kudos to Adelaide. I think, as a side note, they're putting together a pretty productive off-season here. So Peatling had a bit of a breakout year this year, playing 19 games. Good role player for the Giants and spending a bit more time in the midfield there. He adds to this growing crop of Giants players that are potentially leaving, um, of which there's another one I want to talk about in this video as well. And that's kind of getting concerning for their sake, and that's probably worth a video in its own right. But it's extra interesting when you consider that Isaac Cumming, who has nominated them as a free agent and will likely get there over the next week or so, whenever that starts, I think it opens Friday, maybe? Neither he or James Peatling are South Australian. So that's two non-South Australian targets that the Adelaide Crows have acquired. And I usually think that's a good mark of being maybe not a destination club yet, but I think if you can lure players to your club that are not from your state, particularly if you're outside of Victoria, you're doing a lot right. So I think a bit of a tip of the cap to Adelaide here, being very productive after a very disappointing year, one of the youngest teams in the competition last year in terms of you know the actual selected teams. It was like bottom three for age and experience. To get three mature players that are quite distinctly different, they've got Neil Bullen, who's requested a trade there. He is South Australian. But you get Peatling and Cumming, as well as holding pick four in this year's draft. I really like what they've done there. So yeah, interesting little uh, development there from Pete Ling. I kind of assumed wrongly he would end up in Victoria if he left the Giants, but the Crows have got a potentially good player there. Once again, a cost is a little bit harder to answer for an out of contract player who did have a breakout year. Pick 25 is probably going to the Demons um, as has previously been reported for Neil Bourne. So we're probably talking like a future second round pick for Pete Ling. That probably sounds light if you expect Adelaide to improve next year. If they stay in the same position, it's not too bad. But a first round draft pick also sounds too much, particularly since Adelaide have picked four in this year's draft, but maybe a top 20 selection for Pete Ling, would that make sense? I think that's probably about right. It'd be interesting to see how that gets done. It's not clear at this point in time with 25 being virtually committed to the Melbourne Football Club. Let's talk about Geelong now. So uh, since I last did a video, Bailey Smith has formally requested a trade to Geelong. This has been the worst kept secret for a long time. Um, as a side note, I actually have a friend from Geelong who said that she was chatting to Bailey Smith's mum in a pub like a year ago. And she said, oh yeah, he's gonna he's looking to buy a house out here. So I, I kind of had a feeling it was always gonna be Geelong and now it's formal. Big shock, I think everyone's known that for some time. So that's an update in itself, but it's not the most interesting thing out of Geelong today because we've also heard discussion that Clayton Oliver wants to get to Geelong. So to be clear, he hasn't requested a trade formally like Bailey Smith has, but Sam McClure is really running with this story. I think he talked about it on the Tradies podcast, but then he also talked about it on 3AW. So of course, Sam McClure, you know, particularly in recent times, hasn't had the best radar for this sort of thing. Um, however, I think there's, it's Sam Edmonds also talking about this. There's enough noise around Clayton Oliver from a variety of different sources over an extended period of time with all different angles to suggest that he, he was being shopped around by Melbourne. So my understanding of the situation is that Melbourne sort of tried to be discreet by getting the interest of opposition clubs for someone like a Clayton Oliver, who has played below his best for a little while now, has some behavioral issues, including, um, I think Sam Edmund was talking about his behavior at the Brownlow Medal, pissed off some teammates, don't know any other details about that, and his enormous contract, which is also a big factor here. So now we were in a potential scenario here, and I did talk about this in the last update, but there is more info now. But there is a potential scenario here where Clayton Oliver and Bailey Smith get to Geelong. Working out how that happens is the really tricky part, and this is not going to be simple because they're talking about a standoff between Geelong and the Western Bulldogs simply on the Bailey Smith deal. Geelong's first round pick is, uh, I think, 15 nominally right now, but that probably gets pushed back to 18, 19, 20 after, after compensation picks, etc. are dished out. So that in itself 
probably a little bit light. I'd imagine Geelong are not going to be willing to offer two first round picks. I do think that's probably a little bit steep for Bailey Smith, not because of talent, but because of the context of his ACL. Been a while since he's played his best form out of contract. So I'm thinking Geelong could probably offer a first round draft pick this year and some sort of sweetener to the Western Bulldogs. But if that is going to be tricky to get over the line between the two clubs, if it's going to be tricky for those two clubs to have a meeting of the minds around what Bailey Smith is worth, it only gets more tricky with Clayton Oliver because while Melbourne are being proactive with trading Clayton Oliver, part of the reason they'd want to do it is because he has some degree of value as a quality midfielder of the competition. Now, similar to Bailey Smith, it's been a little while since we've seen the best of Clayton Oliver. I'm not too sure exactly what season. Was it 22 he was good? He was certainly good in 21. But there's so many mitigating factors here and and circumstances to consider. So now Geelong's probably, assuming they get Bailey Smith, the the best thing they could offer in this instance is maybe a future first round selection as as a centerpiece of that deal. Again, if you forecast Geelong to be good next year and they were good this year and they didn't have Bailey Smith, then I think... I think he will slot in perfectly to that team. We can assume that Geelong's peak next year is going to be around the late teens at best, in my opinion. So equally, is that beneficial enough to Melbourne to offload him? Well, it kind of depends what really Melbourne are trying to get out of this. Are they truly looking just to maximize draft capital and get a kickstart on a, a, maybe not a rebuild, but a transition of the list? Are they motivated by the money? as in to get money off their books, or are they just simply wanting to get him out of that playing group? Because this is all relevant as to what it's going to cost you long in a trade. Now, considering which team is going to pay like what percentage of Clayton Oliver's contract is also going to be a huge factor in this. And, you know, it's hard to imagine Geelong could completely absorb Clayton Oliver's contract, although it's a little bit hard to tell these days with the salary cap going up. I actually really don't know how much salary cap space clubs are going to have over the next few years, but we can assume that relatively speaking, Geelong's must be fairly full. So if Geelong were hypothetically willing to pay, you know, most or if not all of the contract, that might actually make it cheaper in a draft collateral sense. But if Melbourne say, no, we're willing to pay you know, a huge portion of the contract because we don't necessarily have anyone else coming in yet. They're not completely out of the race for Dan Houston by the sounds of it, but pretty far back. But let's say Melbourne are in a position where they can pay for it, but they want draft collateral. Then in that instance, you know, Melbourne would be expecting a better draft pick back their way. So I suppose working out what Melbourne is trying to get out of this scenario is the first point, because if you're looking at value, Geelong's future first is probably the best part of the deal. Sure, there could be like steak knives coming back to Melbourne, but that's probably the best individual asset they're going to get if they trade Clayton Oliver. So that's going to be very interesting to watch. I'm fearful to think what a Geelong side would look like with Clayton Oliver and Bailey Smith because while neither has you know been elite players over the last 24 months, let's call it, they definitely have that capacity and have been at that level before and are still young enough to be in their prime. And Bailey Smith, I think he's a couple years, maybe three years younger than Clayton. His best football's ahead of him. So this is scary stuff. Got some other details to work through. Luke Parker has officially requested a trade to North Melbourne. He'll join Jack Darling there you'd think won't cost them a whole stack I think we saw that one coming but well done to North Melbourne on being proactive to get some veterans and uh, that's a really good start to their trade period a little bit on Richmond and uh, the negotiations for Rioli and Shea Bolton here so uh, I just picked up that they're looking for a little bit more than pick six for Daniel Rioli Um, you know for the player he is pick six is more than enough but he is contracted so Richmond's just doing what's best for their club and trying to extract maximum value for that so I'm not criticizing them. Uh, However, I don't know what that's going to look like, what else they could get out of that deal. Probably just an extra second or third rounder, really. At this stage, I don't know if Richmond really need more third rounders. So I'm not sure how that's exactly going to go. But Richmond pushing for a bit more than six. I think six is fair, to be honest. Also, a little bit around what Fremantle have offered for Shea Bolton. So the Dockers, as I read, have been prepared to offer two of their first round picks for Bolton, 9 and 16, although Richmond is expected to ask for 9 and 10. Got that from afl.com.au. So 9 and 16, I think, is fairly generous. 9 and 10, two top 10 picks for Shea Bolton is probably a bit of a stretch. And I'd imagine, you know, Richmond's just doing their thing and trying to maximize value here. But I did note as well, it, this is the third place I've read that Fremantle were prepared to offer pick 10 for Liam Baker. That is a stunningly generous offer, honestly. And I suppose the logical conclusion there is that if Fremantle were trying to get Baker and Bolton, they would have parted ways with all three of their first round picks. So they were prepared to go pretty hard this trade period. And perhaps their fans are kind of glad Liam Baker chose West Coast. Personal opinion. Speaking of Fremantle, there was a little bit of a rumor on Tim Kelly um, potentially inquiring about a move to 
Fremantle. Apparently there was a meeting. Um, you know, this this one to me, as soon as I saw this article, it read as though Tim Kelly is trying to get an extension on his contract at West Coast. He's contracted for one more year. Put a little bit of noise out there that uh, other clubs are going to come calling. Oh, wait, Tim Kelly doesn't want to leave WA, so it can only be Fremantle. My educated guess here is that this was just to put pressure on West Coast to extend a contract. I can't imagine Fremantle being seriously interested. And subsequently, his manager came out and said, Tim Kelly is completely committed to the Eagles. So... Yeah, that was that one burned bright for about an hour, I reckon, before the follow-up came. A little bit on Essendon. Um, they've got a bit going on here. I want to start with Dylan Shield. So Dylan Shield has once again been linked to a move from Essendon. This has sort of come up over the last couple of years. And in every previous instance, I'm pretty sure it's been to the Saints. Now GWS, apparently, according to Mitch Cleary, are potentially interested in reuniting with Dylan Shield, who's, of course, an inaugural GWS footballer. Now, this one is probably odd for where the Giants are at. However, I can only think, you know, he's not a bad player and they have lost a whole stack of players and that's going to continue. So would they take on an experienced Dylan Shield? Perhaps, maybe that's what this is about. But this is one of the more surprising stories, to be honest, Dylan Shield to go back to Sydney to play for, I don't know, a couple of years. But Essendon has also put the feelers out to another GWS player. So this this could be in, like all linked into the same deal, but another GWS player might leave in Connor Stone. So I did actually talk about this in a previous video, but now he's more meaningfully linked to the Essendon footy club. First round draft pick a couple of years ago. Um, I can't say that I've really followed him much since. I know he's been a fringe player, had a few opportunities, a lot of sub-affected games at AFL level, kind of a impact forward, potentially explosive midfielder was the way I remember him. But apparently he then played in the VFL as a bit of an intercept defender in the second half of this year, and perhaps that's the role S and C for him. They've also been linked to Josh Rotham, as I talked about, Finn McGuinness they've had a bit of a sniff at, and Jackson Pryor from the Brisbane Lions. So Essendon looking at some relatively cheap deals to try and improve their list. Um, and I've also seen that Peter Wright is absolutely not leaving. A couple of fringe players that are potentially lo looking around. Braden Fiorini, this again is another player that kind of gets brought up in a lot of trade periods. Uh, I think he nearly moved to Collingwood a couple of years ago, um, but in and out of Gold Coast midfield from what I can gather. And you'd imagine probably not a primary piece that team going forward. So potentially there's more money to be had back in Victoria and potentially more playing time. There's been no club at this stage linked to Fiorini, but once again, I would look to a Victorian club who need some experienced midfielders and Richmond is probably the biggest example of that. So that's just an idea. R Richmond could, in theory, have a few options for somewhat mature, cheap midfield or, you know, not necessarily midfielders, but players of any type just to protect their youth because they're going to have a massive influx of young talent this offseason. So we'll wait and see on that, but that is a new name. I've talked about Riley Garcia in the past, um, the Western Bulldogs midfielder that has been in and out of the team. He's been weighing up deals from both Port Adelaide and West Coast and of course the Western Bulldogs too. So he hasn't been cut or anything or told to look for a trade. He has been exploring his own options. The Bulldogs, from what I can gather, uh, st still have a two-year deal in front of him. However, the new news is that St Kilda and North Melbourne are also interested in Riley Garcia. So that's an interesting one. I think he would suit either of those clubs. And again, Richmond, I'll throw into the mix here. They don't seem to be linked to too many players, although actually now that I think about it, Connor Stone, I did read as well, has been linked to Richmond. So they are showing a little bit of interest in a player there, whereas a lot of the Richmond talk this offseason has been players leaving. So again, a side note on Richmond, I think they'll be an interesting one as to what sort of smaller deals do they do for players who aren't going to cost much to try and bolster their best 22. I really think they need to do that. A couple of finishing notes. Cozzy Pickett has been ruled out of a potential move this year by Tom Morris. He says he loves Melbourne, the team, but not so much the city. Loves Simon Goodwin. And every single year, there's rumors of him being homesick, which is possibly true. Um, and I think even as recently as a few days ago, we were still discussing Cozzy Pickett to Fremantle as a slight possibility. Um, but I think we can rule all in through that for now. We know Port's also had a crack in recent times, but yeah, it sounds like he's going to stay in Melbourne. And finally, Joe Danaher retiring. I just thought I'd include that as well. There was obviously a lot of speculation when Mitch Cleary broke the story, actually, um, I think was that the morning of the grand final? I think he did it or the day before that he was going to finish up and you could kind of tell by his goal celebration at the end of that grand final, kick the final goal of the game, actually Joe Danaher. But he's sailing off to the sunset. It's a weird moment for me. I don't this could be the first player that's younger than me that's actually retired. Um, there's probably a few examples of players retiring early for, you know, obviously injury or concussion or moving on to business interests. This is for the first player who I think has played an entire career all the way until 30 and then retired um, and he's younger than me. So this is a big moment for me. Now, but congrats to Joe Danaher on a great career. I wonder how many players 
could say that they've retired a premiership player in their final game and kicked the last goal of the game. I wonder how many could say that. Anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments if there's anything I missed or your particular thoughts on anything I've said in this video. We'll be back very soon for more trade and draft content. And, you know, it's not just that kind of content, other types of content as well as we progress through the off season. But thanks very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.